It's um, wonderful that you've all been able to join us this evening, and it is a delight again to welcome to Beads Steve Biloff, who um, I hope you had the opportunity to listen to when he spoke to us um, around the Raising Boys um, project and then the Raising Girls project and the books that are associated with that. And it was really informative to so many of our parents, Steve, that they were able to listen to you and to gain your advice. And from that, the, the parents have sent in a handful of questions. And, and this evening, we're going to spend some time going through those those questions um, with you. I think the one thing that, that's very clear with, with parenting in the modern age is that sense of loneliness as a parent, that you feel you're on your own and that there aren't many people out there going through the same experience. And I think what was reassuring by the Raising Boys and the Raising Girls talks was that so much of this is common across um, all families and so common across all um, and children. But I think a lot of the questions today will try and explore the, the diversity of, of family life and the diversity of experiences for children. So once again, thank you very, very much for, for joining us and um, we'll get going with some questions. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, you too, Peter. And, and a big hello to everyone over there in in England, um, as you might know, I'm I'm in Tasmania. Um, I can, if I look out of my windows, I can actually see wallabies nibbling my roses. Um, and it's evening time here, so and, and we've been reading about the storms that you've just come through over there, and we hope that you're, all your houses are still um, in in good shape. Um, and um, and thank you for listening to the talks. I hope you really like them. And, and this this is a bit unusual for me to get to do a Q and A. Um, and it's very kind of you to in, invite me and Peter to in, invite me. The, um, I, there's a, a thing I wanted to let you know that um, the, the ideal situation would be, would be a dozen of us sitting in a room and, and we could talk to and fro and I could, you know, I could ask you questions about your questions and we could, you know, dialogue along. That's the ideal way. Um, and, but this is still worth doing. And, um, um, but I want you to know that um, if I was a gardening expert, um, it would be easy. You know, you'd say, I've got thrips on my roses and I'd say, this is what you do. Um, and no problem. But families are not like that. As, as Peter said, that every family is different and they're going through different times and, and conditions. And so I'll be t answering in, in general ways. And some of what I say might, you think, no, that's not my kid. And then something else might just be just right and be helpful. And especially um, what I'm saying for one question might relate to someone else's thinking as well. And so if you just bear in mind that, that we're just fumbling around here, parenthood is all about fumbling around. Um, and <laughs> families are kind of made up of scar tissue, basically. And so um, with that understanding, let's, let's have a go and we'll see how we, how we go. Um, I, the, Steve, the one thing that parents are quite rightly in, in, in the modern era concerned by is um, the challenges that are brought about by um, interactions with others and the extent to which children are comfortable in social settings. We've got a question here from a, from a parent asking about their son, who, who's an adolescent, and his struggles with social anxiety. And how do we go about supporting young men, young girls, um, with social anxiety? Okay, uh, now that's a, it's a, a, a good question and, a, and a, a very one that I hear all the time. And to what social anxiety is, um, to delineate it from, from general anxiety, which is a, a very widespread problem with kids, but social anxiety you, is when a young person is completely fine on their own. They're, they're not at all bothered on, in their own company, doing their own thing, and usually at home in the family. It's, it's when, but going out amongst other kids, they get very stressed. And so we ha you, ha you think, okay, with any uh, challenge or problem that a young person has, what would the, 
what would the antidote look like or what would the um, what would it look like if that problem was solved? And so you naturally think, well, um, you want them to have confidence. Um, or, or, and if not, and, and not everyone is confident, in, even in good mental health, some of us are, are quiet and some of us are brash and noisy. And so um, really just being comfortable in their own skin. And what we know about where confidence comes from, especially in, since this is a boy that we're talking about, is that we don't get confidence from the peer group. We mostly get it from our same sex parent. And so for a boy, it comes a lot from his dad and, and believing in himself and liking himself come much more from his dad. And, and people who watch the Raising Boys um, talk, remember I had a, um, a diagram that looks like this and it's um, where we sort of say there are three stages of, of boyhood. I think Peter, you had seen that, that diagram on the board in the talk. And so little boys hang uh, are primarily close to their mum and, and, um, and dads can do a lot, but mum's central. But, and then from six to 14, boys kind of, kind of cross the bridge to dad and they're still close to mum, but their dad is much more primary in, and they're wanting to follow dad around and they think dad is amazing and they want to be like dad. And then around 14, uh, they get a bit sick of dad and they want to move on to a wider range of, of male role models. And so um, when we... Um, want to improve a boy's confidence, one of the things that seems to work is if they spend um, more time with their dad and do things around their dad. And, um, and that might, one of the things I really, really recommend for, for families, boys or girls, um, and really at any age, is, is the three-day trip where, um, say if it's dad and son, they go away for three days, um, just the two of them, because when we're in our families, then we're, it's always very complicated. But if, um, if a parent and child go away together um, and they have a couple of nights sleeping away, it gives them time to get the things that are in be getting between them will come up. You know, you know, dad, you never do this, you know, or whatever. You know, usually you have a big fight sometime in the middle of those three three days and a lot of stuff comes to the surface and also you you're cooking meals together and you're getting you know ready for bed together and and it it, it builds a, a bond um that maybe hasn't been happening um in the tumult of family life and british families are some of the most busy families in in the world and and life is is pretty full on and um and so hanging a, a boy who lacks confidence one of the things we would say is have to have more time with his dad and even sometimes with his dad and other men as well um and so that um we, we are big fans of of you know dads and sons or or dads and daughters or mums and daughters going away with a bunch of other parents um because sometimes a son is nothing like his dad and doesn't have a lot of shared interests but he'll be around uh, you know kind of uncle figures and other men who are much more his kind of man. You know, maybe they're artistic or maybe they're um, very practical or very athletic and, and dad is, might be none of those things or one but not the other. And so, so it's kind of getting more adults, affirming that young man and, and conveying to him um, almost implicitly, you're, 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 you're a good guy and you're terrific and, and you've got lots of qualities. And so when he's out in the, in the rough and tumble of the peer group, he's got that sort of bedrock feeling of himself that I'm, I'm an all right person. Um, and um, yeah, the, and with, with social anxiety, it's just one other thing, which is a very remote thing, remote possibility. And, and that is that um, that's one of the primary sim, um, signals of or symptoms of being on the autis, autistic spectrum. And I, I had social anxiety and I was eventually diagnosed, as people might have read in my books, as being, being autistic. And um, it's not, you know, if it's a really big issue and there's one or two other things like having real problems with social skills, um, and, very focused interests that are not shared by other people. Um, it's not a bad idea to just talk to a psychologist and see, and see if that's the case. In girls, 
um, girls are so good with social skills and their brain works to a degree differently that anxiety is the only diagnostic criteria for autism. Um, it may be that nothing else shows except that she just gets incredibly anxious uh, about the big world and it turns out she's autistic but nobody knew because she was so good at masking it. But generally young men um, would be, um, you would know if you, it's just like, wait a minute, and that's often how it is in a family, you think, wait a minute, maybe, maybe they're on the spectrum somewhere and it is a spectrum of different degrees and then they can get some specialized help with that as well. So th th that may not be anything to do with this question, but just it's, it's worth knowing about. Uh, definitely worthwhile covering those, that broad aspect of, of that social anxiety and the differences between general anxiety and, and social anxiety. Mm. I suppose w when you talk about role modeling, that stretches into, as you said, different adults, because obviously families are, are pretty diverse and there will, there will be families where there, there isn't a male role model within the family um, circle. And yes. how, how, do you, how, are, how are we able to support that? Is, that? is that about, as you say, about using or having additional um, same-sex adults around that can support or um, in families where there are, are same-sex um, if it's a same-sex couple, the, the mm. two moms, is, is, is that role modeling able to be played out in the, in the same way? And, and to what extent do schools or teachers have a role in that role modeling as well? Yes, uh, yeah, all of those things. Um, it's, um, um, school is a really brilliant place for kids to see um, other kinds of masculinity and, and, and other, uh, the r full range of how to be a man and how to be a woman. And, um, and I, I worked in hundreds of schools during the 1990s, early 2000s, training the staff of schools. And one of the things we were t teaching was that all children, but boys especially, only learn relationally. They, they have to feel, because of their wiring for danger, um, they have to feel absolutely convinced that the teacher actually likes them. Um, and, and the, the, we say the three F's of a teacher would be um, friendly, fun, and focused for a boy, um, and so that the um, so that the boy isn't on guard; he's not feeling under attack. Um, and so that we're finding the, the new generation, and I'm sure it would be the case because it's it's cl clear in your nature, Peter, and and I'm sure in your staff as well. Um, the teachers today are much more um, real to their kids you know if a teacher might say you know my mum died this week and i'm just a bit I'm, I'm, I'm you know pretty tired and sad so you know um just wanted to let you know that and and the kids you know think wow you know a teacher's a human being you know and um another teacher might say how excited they are to be expecting a baby and and the kids are wow you know they're all really concerned for their teacher and look after them and the, the big burly boys are kind of telling people to back off in the corridor to give a room. And, and so um, the role modeling is not a distant thing. It's not like footballers on television. It's, it's people that you see every day. Um, and yes, I, I learned a lot from my, from the families I worked with. I didn't learn from books. I learned from the families and that what they told me, single mums said, look, I just realized I had to get some, my son had to know what a good man looked like. Um, you can't turn into one if you've never seen one. And so I persuaded my granddad to, to you know, to have him come and stay in the holidays. Or I, I got my brother to, to take him, you know, on a big trip to Scotland, hiking and things like that. And, um, and so, and us guys, I think if you're a dad um, going somewhere with your son, perhaps take your son's friend as well. Um, so that um, so that we kind of step up to do the fathering where there's a bit a bit of a gap, um, and it's very rare that a father, even if there is one, is everything that his son needs, um, and so we should always be stepping up and, and helping each other with, with our families. Yeah, excellent. And then obviously coming slowly, eking our way out of of the impact of the pandemic and 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 the associated lockdowns that we've experienced, and the same with, with you in Australia, 
is the impact that that time away from social interaction um, has had on, on, on young people and mm. the extent to which it's impacted on their emotions. So there's a question here from a parent about the fact that they've noticed their child become increasingly short tempered mm. and finds it more difficult to manage their, their anger or, or their outbursts. And yes. is, there, is, is there a way in which there is, um, the, we can manage that and we can support that or, or what are the sort of steps that you can assist in, in their management of, of emotions having come out of the lockdown? Yes, yes. Now, um, there is just to let, you know, not exactly reassurance, but just to have a context that there is now massive anxiety in, in this generation of young people. It's never been this severe. And it was that way even before the, the virus came along. And, and that's, of course, that's just made it much worse. And so, so we all need to have a handle on anxiety in our families today. And, and, and I've been writing new books just specifically about this and doing new talks. But the, the thing to understand is that um, in a family, um, it's like, well, okay, sorry, I'll just bridge, bridge it a little bit more. The, um, Anxiety can come out in two ways. It can come out in a um, clear, sort of straightforward way where a kid just says, you know, I'm scared and they're, and they're nervous and they have tummy aches and they don't sleep and things like that. Um, but it also comes out through getting stroppy and, 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 and through aggression. Um, and, it's this, um, and so some kids implode and some kids explode. Um, but the cause is the same. And, and one of the things we've learned in, you know, I worked with violent men um, at, at some stages and, and they're just basically massively anxious and, and they direct it in a really bad way. And, um, but, but the cause is always to do with them learning to manage their anxiety. And in a family, this is something which I think um, people watching tonight will, will realise as soon as I say it, that, that our kids are like corks and they bob up and down on the waves of the of the adults anxiety and so um so a family will have a kind of a level of anxiety as a family um one of, one of my books which i'll just wave in a, for a minute is is this book called 10 things girls need most and um that has a we put in it a, a family stress questionnaire um to just kind of get a an idea how stressed is your family and nothing flash it's sort of thing you might get in a magazine but it's just gets you thinking you know are we a family that's really under the hammer um and what happens is as the adults you know you and me peter and everyone watching tonight we we're accustomed to plowing on through very high levels of stress and um and so if someone was to ask us how we're going um, we would we would say I'm fine, and we would sincerely we wouldn't be lying. We would sincerely believe that. Um, but if you were to take a you know a heart rating or a, a hook you up to an EEG machine, it would be going off the scale. And and we just in the modern world we're just used to that. Um, and but the but our kids are um, not not hardened and we don't in a way we don't want them to be we want them to be open-hearted and 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 so um the first thing when when i'm asked a question like that you know one of my, my kids just blows up is what could you do to you know, to lower the stress levels for everybody um and so things come in straight away like um one day a week we just don't do anything you know Saturdays every week, people stay in their PJs and they make pancakes and, and watch videos and, and schlep around all day. There's no programmed rushing schedule for the whole day. And, and it gives you, your body a chance to you know, settle. Because um, everything human beings do, there's the action and the reaction. And so even when you watch a movie, um, you process the movies, you know, in the hours afterwards, if something happens to children at school, or very often kids hang on at school, 
when they get home, they just explode because they've been hanging on all day. Um, and parents are very relieved to hear that, that um, um, just, you know, they're not bad. They just have been carrying it all the time. And, and just, you know, go, you know, whatever we do, we just, you know, walk it off or run it off or have a big family shout, you know, we've made it to the end of the day, let's have a family scream. And, and my daughter and I came through, my daughter's grown up now, but we came through some, some um, really rough stuff we had to deal with. Um, and, and we just, so we got home and said, let's, you feel like screaming? I said, I yes, so do I. Let's do it. We just let out this wild noise and felt a whole lot, had a laugh and felt a whole lot better. And so um, other things that, that are, um, helpful you know, music is helpful um, um but mostly it's to do with slowing things down and and also as as adults um being open with our kids that um if we when you talk to someone who's anxious what happens is that if you make a real connection they will it'll soothe them and so um when kids come home from school and they're very wired up about something um what happens is, is if two people in the same room are very stressed, oh, sorry, if two people are in the same room and their stress levels will always average out in, in about 10 minutes, they'll be on the same level. And so if your child is stressed, um, your job in a way is to stay down here and, and over the next, you know, hanging out together and just talking and maybe making a sandwich or whatever you're doing, gradually they'll be talking to you and their stress level will slowly come down to where yours is. Um, but if they're stressed and you get stressed as well about what they're telling you and you get cross with them and say, well, you know, you should have done your homework, you know, and no wonder the teacher blew you up and it just goes up and up and up and up. And so I think what we know now about the brain is that um, we regulate each other's um, arousal levels. And, and so as, as parents, our job is to help our kids to co-regulate and, and, and come down. And sometimes that means really perhaps mum and dad or dad and dad or mum and mum having a conversation about, you know, is our family life really just off the scale? You know, what's, what's happened to us? Are we living the way we want to be living? Um, and maybe making some big changes and ditching some commitments or shortening work hours or things like that. I could, it's a big topic. I could go on, but I hope that gives some, some clues, Peter. Really helpful. Really, really useful. And, and that thing, and I think that that notion of, of balancing and regulating one another's um, emotions and anxieties, I think is really important because we can either in support of the child or against the child, we can get ourselves really, really caught up in, in, in their anxiety and for us to be the regulator that sort of calms the situation down to be able to have um, a, a, a non-emotional conversation or a non-judgmental conversation, I think is so important. Talking about self-regulation, one of the things that, that crops up in, in the modern era time and time again is social media and how do we, how do we manage our children and, and the young people off social media and get them to get a balance of, of its use. And second to that is in, in respect of restricting access and putting limits on the use of social media use and whether it's the various platforms of social media. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yes, this is a really important subject. Uh, and the, first of all, it's to, to realize why, why we, we have to um, restrict social media. Because um, if you understand why, then um, it makes it easier to have some backbone in, in doing that. And basically, um, our nervous system, our, our, our mind is, is, is wired up for, for being around about a dozen other people. The human beings evolved in clans and the clans were about 12 or 15 people who were together all the time and they were related and they loved each other and they, they hunted and they gathered in a small group. And we developed our complete social wiring so that we could monitor um, how everybody was. And, 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 and work as a team where human beings survived through teamwork. And so, and girls in particular um, are much more, uh, the average girl, much more socially wired than the average boy. 
um, and, they, and their system is alert to the feelings of the people around them. Now, that's a really great strength. That would make you a very good prime minister, a very good, you know, running a hospital or a school. And we want that. We want them to have that um, capacity to be empathic and responsive to people, and notice people's cues. Um, what social media does is it makes about 500 people your ecosystem. Your social ecosystem has way too many people. They're people who don't give a damn about your mental health. And in fact, some of them would enjoy destroying it. And, and, um, and many, many girls today will be still awake after midnight um, checking their various social media platforms. Now, they're not doing that um, happily. It's not a fun thing. If you think about it, Peter, and I think everyone listening, it's, it's, it's monitoring um, if there's any danger, any, it's kind of threat monitoring. Um, and so the, the playground for kids is often a, a, a pretty rough place. And, um, but at least if you remember having a rough year when you were a kid at school, everyone watching would have had a, one rough year at school, I'm sure, where you just hated being at school for a year and for various reasons. And but at least when you went home at night, you were home for 12 hours, 14 hours of respite. And home was the place of emotional rest. Um, but with social media, you're in the playground 24 seven. And, and that is just not good for your nervous system. And it's destroying the mental health of girls. You know, one in five girls in the Western world, I think I said in the talk, are, will be on medication for anxiety. And, and so I went on, people will smile, I went on Facebook about two years ago because I've got a, a community, two communities with nearly a quarter of a million people on them. Uh, the raising girls and the raising boys communities. And I asked people, what are you doing about social media? And a bunch of people came on. I think the first one was from Ireland. And they said, there's a new thing we're doing amongst our community. Um, we're all the, the family is all putting their devices on the charger at tea time. When we sit down for tea or dinner at night time, Mum, dad, the kids, every, everyone's device goes on the kitchen bench on its, on its charging point. And we don't go near them till the next morning. And, I, and I'm reading this on the Facebook feed and I, and I said, yeah, can you do that? And, um, and they said, well, um, it's, it's working really well. And um, the adults, um, part of it is that us adults have got to do it as well. Um, and, um, and our daughter, um, didn't like the idea, um, but, um, she's, she's a different girl, you know, she, she sleeps at night now and she's keen to get to school, but she was dreading school before. And, and so, um, so the whole family is more present. Um, and now, they might, girls might complain, but I had a girl get in touch with me and she said, look, my mum and dad brought in this rule and I just want to let you know, it's the best thing they ever did because I couldn't have done it myself. Um, we, we have a, a very good psychologist called Michael Carr Gregg in Australia who, who put this message out very strongly. Kids' brains are not able at, in their teens to, they haven't developed breaks is the way he put it. They're not good at putting brakes on themselves. So they're prone to impulsiveness and to addictive, getting hooked on things. And um, that's our job is to be the brakes. Um, and we're helping them gradually to put on their own brakes, but um, they can't do it. And this girl said, I wouldn't, I would never have been able to give up social media. And so my parents made this rule and um, I go to school the next morning and nothing, nothing had um really happened or change I could nothing I couldn't catch up with um it's just a whole bunch of my friends got hysterical in the middle of the night over something someone said you know what Darlene said to Marlene about Charlene you know and um and so it's uh it's it's just it's our job it's as, as, as simple as that um and 
once it's established, you know, whatever you just, you know, whatever you individually decided for your family, you know, people are saying we won't have any smartphones until they're 15 or 16. Some people are saying it's, you know, and those devices are not appropriate to this age group, you know, and unfettered access to the internet is not appropriate. Um, other people are having this curfew every night. Um, and people, you know, different versions of, of, of the right, what they feel is the right thing. I'm not wanting to uh, make some rule about it, but tailor it, but um, to say that there are many things with adolescence where you'll put your foot down um, and do it, you know, with, um, in a caring way and, and talk about the reasons why. Um, and, um, but still, it, it's, it is our job to do and, and and kids pretty soon learn that that's that's how it is and they grumble about us at school and um and, and that's that's their job as well and and that the 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 rationalization around the 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 decision i think is so mm. important is, is explaining the reasons why social media has to be limited or you need to consider the the extent of the time that you spend on the social media platform in the same way on the on the other on the other side of the coin you've got to explain if you if if parents want their children to be outside in engaging in physical activity running around physical health being being a part of other activities which are stimulating whether those are creative activities artistic um sporting whatever those activities are again it's 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 the explanation of the reason why it's really important to be doing those outside of being caught up in, in the world of your device. Yes, yes. And, um, and yes, with boys, um, it, it's some terrible studies that are coming out that uh, those boys who just live on computer games are and actually not growing their brains properly. Um, there's social interaction grows parts of your cortex, which, which do social interaction. It's a, it's actually, you, you wire up as you get, as you grow and, um, and just not developing uh, in the, the art of being with other people. Um, and, and so really important. Sometimes families, find they get into a, say a big fight over say bringing the phone to the dinner table or something like that and, and um it's important to um sometimes think okay we just fight about everything and 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 to kind of go sort of do a ring around that and and say you know what's really the problem is that our whole relationship is not very good now all we do is bicker and fight and and it's there's a false idea that family life is supposed to be people being horrible to each other with teenagers and that's not the case um and it's a really good thing sometimes to sit down with a, um, a young person and and say look um our family is just not a lot of fun anymore and and i feel like i'm just biting your head off all the time and and um I don't like that very much. How is it, is, is it like that for you as well? You know, what do you, how would you rate our family out of five at the moment? And, and the, and have a bit of a heart to heart about that. And there's a thing I always say with, with, with kids, it's a bit like, you know, there's parent and child talking and well, what, often what parents do, I just sort of it's like, there's their faces showing there and they've got a, like a, they're hiding their heart. They're saying a lot of people, you know, this is what you should do and that's what you should do and the young person's here. And sometimes as parents, we have to sort of just take that away and, and speak from the heart and say, you know, I, I feel um, really um, sad and, um, you know, we cook meals and we sit down and I feel bad that we don't talk and it, it isn't any fun um in our family at, at the moment and the reason i'm making a fuss about the phone is i'm i'm missing um joking around with you and talking and hearing about your day and so i want to bring in some some rules about it but um that's the reason you know I'm, it's not that i just want to be the boss um and and i think very often we th th some sort of a crisis happens um 
parents and children kind of find each other again and and build a closeness again and um and it's sometimes through something going badly or going wrong um that we realize oh you know mum's different to how i thought she was you know i'm 15 now and um i, I have to start seeing mum as a human being um or seeing dad as a person who's got a lot of stress in his job you know and he comes comes home and and he's um he's got things going on and and, and i think in the pan in the pandemic people got very very stressed and what fixes that is being able to say that um and you know relationships cure stress and when we say i'm really worried and someone else says they're really worried or really sad then we feel for them um and 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 it just automatically the connection just makes us feel like well yes at least we're not alone in this and then we feel stronger and we can can go ahead and, and overcome it excellent thank you very much the next sort of questions are, are sort of more broad questions rather than just focus, focusing just on, on on social media and it sort of comes back to something we spoke about um sort of at the start was in in that in that in in families where, where they are now reordered families so the partner of a of a divorced of a divorced couple a new yes. partner is what's how, how does that partner find their place are they are they to be are they to be seen as as um stepping into to somebody else's shoes or they somebody entirely different and are they meant to be the cool the, the cool new partner or or how does how does that work because that navigating that relationship in step families is 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 difficult and, and uh, particularly at the start the understanding of the disordered nature of of, of yes. and the reordered nature the reordered nature of a family as a consequence yes yes i um it, it, there's a first of all there's a lot of really good resources and and some books and and websites about step families and and it's good to get in in there and and see how it's 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 a very common journey that we, we make um and the the main thing that i would bring to that is that um it's it takes it takes time and um you're you see when, when we're the the birth parents of of children we we've got a lot of a standing with them we, we've we've made them meals and tucked them into bed and taken them to sports and and sat you know in hospitals with them for years and and they've got a deep sense that we care about them and so when we pull on the leash a little bit they sort of think well you know there's a big part of them thinks well they know mum cares about me and 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 we've got some leverage with that um but but a stranger doesn't have that bond yet and so so kids naturally just resent someone telling them off or or doing things um because that in a sense they haven't earned that right does that make sense peter and and so and i think most new partners are pretty sensitive to that and, and um and, and in some ways might even be a bit too sensitive and try to be you know so kind of generous and intense and 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 out to prove that they're a good the good guy um and they might be a bit insecure with their new partner and you know are they as good as their last partner and all sorts of things come in and so again vulnerability is always the our friend um and and what do i mean by vulnerability is just being putting your cards on the table and and you say to your young person um um i'm just learning how to do this um to be a, a stepmom and i really would like to um to be what you need in a stepmom um and it's not the same as your mum and and um i won't ever try to replace your mum in any way but but i hope that i can be um a, a real positive in in your life i think you're you're really great and i'd like to 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 do that and um but it's scary and i'll sometimes i'll get it wrong 
and maybe if you can tell me when I'm getting it wrong, that would help me. Um, and so we're not used to doing this as adults, which we think we've got to put on a, you know, a brave front. Um, but there's something very winning and um, relaxing to the child to realize that this person is not, not falling at their feet, but, but open, open hearted with them and learning. Everyone's learning all the time. Um, even in the most, you know, traditional family or the most untraditional, everyone's just finding their way. And kids are, kids are just finding their way. They, they know they're struggling. And if they see that we're just finding our way too, then there's this enormous relief comes in. Um, you can, uh, it's, it's um, rupture and repair is the term that's now used. We, you, we're always rupturing and repairing, rupturing and repairing as we go along. You know, getting it wrong and apologizing and trying better next time. And what happens is that it's a bit like the muscle tissue. People that are into athletics and bodybuilding. It's actually builds the strength in your muscles. The fact that you've really ripped those muscles doing those, those exercises gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And what makes a strong family is not that they haven't had any problems. It's that they've had lots of problems and they've always worked them out and stuck with them um, and and you know you can I, I, Sharon and I've been together for 42 years now and um, you just kind of get this feeling like oh we still misunderstand each other and get st stuff things up but but there's a feeling like oh, well at the end of the day we'll sit down and figure it out It'll, we'll get a handle on it there's nothing to freak out about yeah and I suppose the the next thing is Building on on that and that misunderstanding and the rupturing and the repairing and and those things which are are so important um, as a part of that whole learning process is about building clear boundaries for for your family and building clear boundaries for your children, especially considering the perception or, or possible reality that other parents and other households aren't. In, in, intent on doing the same as you. So without building resentment amongst your your children, how do you establish those clear boundaries to to every now and again when you have to say no? Um, and it's imp and I think it is important to say no and important to have clear boundaries. But how how are you able to do that without causing um, too much upset? Yeah, um, it's um, boundaries are an interesting thing because. Um, they, you need them, um, but you don't want them to be too hard and rigid either. Um, and, um, and so, you know, not eating sweets, you know, because the sugar isn't good for you, but you go to grandma's and she piles sweets onto the kids. Um, it's like, yeah, but that's all right because the rest of the week we won't do it. Whereas some people, their boundaries are so rigid um, that, um, that they're not growth promoting. Um, and um, there's no doubt if, if you're parenting well in this culture, um, you'll be at odds with a lot of other families because there's a, there's a, quite a collapse of parenthood going on in, in, in Western culture where people just are so busy and so desperately wanting to get ahead financially and, and things like that, that, um, that they just don't want to have any stress or strain with their kids. And so they just don't have any boundaries and they just want to be their children's friend. Um, and strangely, the kids actually don't like that at all. And, and kids will actually escalate and get wilder and wilder looking, perhaps even just unconsciously, you know, um, looking for someone to put the brakes on. Um, I used to run a youth group when, when I was in my 20s and, and with some, some other people in the church we belonged to. And there'd be some kids who just wouldn't go home at the end of the night. And we'd say, you know, you're just hanging around. So we want to close the place up. You know what? Don't your parents mind when you get home? And, they, and the kids more than once said, um, no, our parents don't care when we get in. And they, they didn't say this, but it was kind of like, we wish they did. 
Does, does that make sense, Peter? And, and you know, we wish they did care. Um, and so, um, if you're secure in your family's um, way of doing things, um, you can feel secure that your kids will try out other ways um, and still come back to yours. Um, and, and it won't fall apart if there's the occasional, you know, and, and, you know, another family does something differently. Now, that, there's limits to that. I remember in uh, some small children that I, that I know where some people moved in in the street and they, the little kids went over to the, the new people's house and to play and came back and said, oh, there's magazines on the table with ladies with no clothes on, on the on the coffee table, daddy, you know, what was, what was that? What are those magazines? And, and my friends whose kids this were, were just, just uh, our kids are not going to that house anymore. You know, they can play in the street, but that's just too far. That's a very bad uh, warning sign. Um, so there will be people that are just so far beyond the pale for you. And, and that's things like, you know, providing alcohol to 15 year olds at parties and things like that, where it's like, I'm sorry, that's just not simply not safe or responsible. And we won't associate with that. But a little bit of a little bit of difference is, um, is good for kids to experience, you know, they, you know, they stayed up till midnight watch, watching TV and we wouldn't have been allowed to do that. And, and you know, how was that? Oh, well, we actually got really cranky and tired, you know, <laughs> and, and it's useful, useful to experience different ways. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's a middle road for people. I've got a last, last couple of questions. The, the first one comes in from, from a dad who is concerned. He's got a, a young daughter who's, who's growing up and um, hasn't, hasn't quite re reached adolescence yet. There's no, there's no female um, female figure in her life at all. How does he how does he broach the issues of of body change, body image as she grows up through through adolescence? Okay, okay. So um, first, I just if the, the dad who wrote that question, if you're watching, I just want to send you a big hug. Um, it's um, that's a tough call to be doing that and and great that you you're doing it and um and that can only have come about i'm guessing through some pretty rough circumstances as well that you've survived and you're there and your daughter is safe and well so so as we say in australia good, good on you and um and i think you've pinpointed something which is um that we do need to have um same sex figures in a child's um, life a daughter needs a, a teenage girl needs to know some some aunties um, some auntie figures um, I think you, you said that there's no one filling that bill at the moment and so um, it's it's these days kids they get good sex education at school and health education in terms of the biology of of you know menstruation and periods and, and things like that um, it's more the um, and you can ch check check with uh, with the school, and, and, and they'll update you on what they cover and and what age, and, and so you can feel reassured about that. And, and Peter's nodding his head to that. But the um, it's more the emotional support, and I think the girls, adolescent girls, need emotional support from a woman as well as as a man, and 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 so um, maybe to look at you know. It, is there anyone that would step up to do that and, and spend time with her and chat to her on a regular basis about how life is going that, that you would be comfortable with and would trust? Um, even if it's if you're really, really, um, there is literally nobody, um, it's not a bad idea to have a counsellor or someone who just, you know, you don't have to be in trouble to have a counsellor. You could, you know, say to your daughter, "Would you like to have a, a, someone that you talk to once a month, or something like that?" Who, and and she can sort of choose the person and and decide who would be good for her. Um, and but in, and perhaps at school there'll be a, a woman counsellor who, and and I, I'm pretty sure there there would be who who can just say, "Look, you know, you're growing up w without a mum and and." Um, that's 
you're doing great, but but you want to drop in every now and then and, and just just you know because we, we really care about you and 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 how you're going and um and girls can get a feeling of it, it, um, at um at, at the age of 12 most girls kind of kick off from their mum quite a bit if they even if they've got a mum they sort of push off they say i don't want to be like mum it's very normal and um and they're very they have a space for for aunties for auntie figures um and um and so really every girl should have an auntie figure or two um, even if they have got a mum, it's, it's exactly the same. Um, and so really hope that you get the support that you need in, in that regard and so that you, your heart can be eased. Um, you can, you know, you can be the 99% of what your daughter needs and, 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 um, and just that 1% that will, will be brilliant to, to put on top of that. Yeah, so good wishes to you with raising her. And the last, the last question we've got is from a couple who are a same-sex parenting couple. They've got mm -hmm. a child who is currently very young or rather young, so hasn't necessarily experienced um, questions around that, that family makeup and the diversity of that family makeup compared to a traditional makeup. And what, what is there that they can do as, as a as a couple to support the child as it grows up and will inevitably start having questions asked of, of the family makeup. How do, how do we support that particular um, situation? Yes. Well, I, I always, I was a, a, um, for a time had, had a private practice where I was seeing that quite a few same sex couples. I don't understand why, except perhaps, it got in the grapevine that I was uh, interested in, in help, helping with, with that. And, and thank goodness times have changed so much now. And this is very normal now. And everybody knows same sex couples raising kids and there'd be, you know, a whole bunch of parents, same sex parents at the school and, and in the wider community. And so it's really, and particularly if you talk to young people themselves, it's just really no big deal. Um, but you have a natural concern that, that you voice that that probably sooner or later um, someone will be unkind about this that, that that there is that small nub of people in the community that that just have a different beliefs about what's how we do families and so the I, I was thinking about this the the, the, the worst case scenario is that, that a they meet a child or or someone in and very unlikely in the early age but but sometime later on when they're starting to go a bit further afield um there's someone who says um you know that's wrong it's wrong that you 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 know got two dads you know and that that's the very worst that can happen i think is someone just says your your family isn't all right and so i think we do have to um prepare kids for sometimes people will be mean about us, our family, and um, and we can't always change the way other people think. Um, but if it's a if it's a person who cares and they're a friend, they'll they won't let that get in the way of being friends with you. Um, you can even say to them, "Well, that's you know, who, who told you that? Who told you that it's not okay to have two dads or two mums?" And they'll say, "Oh, my parents don't believe that's right," and say, "Well." What do you think? You know, do you agree with your parents? And that'll sometimes give us, you know, like put it into question a little bit. And um, sometimes people get bullied um, because bullies will bully you for anything they can think of. Um, that you've got big front teeth, or or you're thin, or big, or whatever. Um, and and they, they might just choose this because that's something that they can choose. Um, and I really like the Buddhist teacher, T Tishnat Han, who died recently. He said, he was talking to children. He said, bullies um, are people who have a lot of pain. They carry unbelievable amounts of pain. And, and they bully other people because when they make someone else feel bad, a tiny little sliver of their own pain goes away. For a few minutes and um and so you have to look with compassion on people who are 
full of hurt and full of hate and learn some breathing you know the other thing about anxiety of any kind is slow steady breathing slow deep breathing and and when you do slow deep breathing your your heart rate slows down and you feel like you're cocooned from all the nastiness around you and you remember the how much how well loved you are and then you just don't buy in to the to the the hate and and to, you can say to your kids you know there's there's ugliness in the world but there's a lot more love than there is ugliness and um and the, the love will always win over the ugliness um so they know it's there and they know it they're likely to encounter it but but they also can keep keep it in perspective and, and they're armed uh, against it i hope that makes sense yeah it's no it does it does very much and and that that concept of, of making sure that everybody regardless of 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 who they are how they how they are how they're brought up or the environment in which they're brought up that they have a sense of belonging that they've got a sense of acceptance and for all of us it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to to illustrate that acceptance to illustrate that sense of belonging because as you say uh, and, and and quite quite importantly um, to wrap things up as you say is you know there is ugliness in the world but there is a significant more love in the world and for us to focus on that i think is the most important thing um yes. Steve, thank yes. you so very very much um we've come to the end of our, our questions it's been absolutely brilliant i'm so grateful for you um giving up so much of your time to be and with, with the two video talks um that you were very kind to to share with us but also um today to to share with us your time with with the questions and answers and for being so open and informative for all of our parents with regards to the points that they've they've raised. Um, and before we before we close up, um, one last question um, from me: What what's next on 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 Steve Biddulph's um, horizon? What what what's happening next? All right. Well, um, I, people may not know, but I I wrote a book just recently called Fully Human, and um, and it's about understanding your brain and um and how to use your mind better um to have good mental health and i'm now working on a version of for specifically for helping children with that and and um and so uh, writing about um um how how children can use their more of their mind um and be in touch with their inner world so that they can find where their strength lives um and and it's it's exciting stuff uh, um my little fingers are, 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 are smoking as i'm as i go but th thanks so much i feel like i'm we're all family now with bead school and and lovely to have this time with you as well and, and much love to everyone watching we'll, we'll see you again one day i hope thank you so much steve thank you very very much for your time it's greatly appreciated take care yeah, bye -bye.